tonight. I've been invited by your great worship pastor and pastor. Uh, Nathan is a friend of mine, and I am on staff at Bethany First, and I'm excited to be here with you and worship with you. So I want to invite you to stand with me, if you would, and let's pray together and offer this time to God. Father God, we know that when we come into this place that you have already been here, that your spirit is already moving about. So God, as your spirit continues to move through this place, through our hearts and into our lives, we ask God that we would be open vessels to what you would have for us and that you would reveal your will to us, God. I pray for Susie as she brings your word. I pray for every part of this service and even as we leave this place this evening, that we would go out into this world and experience the love and the grace that you have for us to pass on to others, God. We love you. We're excited to be here together and to worship you for all that you are and all that you've done and that you are going to do. Everyone said together, amen. Let's worship together. My hope, it's all in him. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not, I dare not trust the sweetest strain, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong, and the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems inside, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on. I'm 
here my heart will sing a lot of times we sing we sing what we hear in our head and what we know in our head the words that we see but to say that we sing from our heart that's when our worship becomes emotive we're connecting our head to our hearts so my heart will sing we know we sing and we we see the words and we sing them we say them but when we sing them from our hearts, they become emotive and we pour our love back out to God. So I wanna just sing that, those words together again. I want you to think about it in that way. That it's coming from your heart. The name of Jesus, proclaiming, lifting it up. Just sing it out. My heart will sing no other name. 
Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. As we continue to sing, if you'd like to remain standing, whatever posture of worship you'd like to do, be comfortable to be seated. Just continue to sing. Just sing this with me. I think you know it. Lord, we need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. to you when temptation comes my way when we can and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you cause you are Lord Jesus you're my hope and stay when I can when I cannot stand I'll fall on you you are Lord Jesus you're my hope and stay song. I want you to sing it with me. Sing, I need thee, Lord, I need thee. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Just our voices, you sing it out. Savior. 
Savior, I come to Thee. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we want that to be more than just a song we sing. If we know our hearts tonight, that really is what we desire. And we need you this hour. As great as um, yesterday was, this is a new day. And Father, we pray that in this service tonight, that our hearts would be yielded to you. That we'd be open to whatever it is that you would um, say to us. Thank you for how you've already used your servant, Susie, and pray that you'll continue um, to speak through her. Pray that you'd clothe her with power from on high. We pray, God, that you would um, impart to her a fresh anointing, that she might speak your words to us, and that our response would be, yes, Lord. Yes to your will and yes to your way. Father, in a world that's filled with so many needs and in a world that's filled with so many voices that speak into our lives, I pray tonight that we would um, see our need for you and that above all else, we would hear your voice. So speak clearly. May we have hearts um, to respond to what it is you'd have to say to us in this service. And for all that is accomplished, for every victory that's won, for the opportunity that we'll have to grow closer to you. We want to give you praise in advance. We ask it all in the strong name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.
will carry me home. I am redeemed. You said me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain. Cause I'm not who I used to be. I am Set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain. I'm not who I used to be. No, Jesus, I'm not who I used to be. God, I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. God redeemed. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle Owen. I love working with him. We got to work together a few years ago at Olivet Nazarene University in Revival, and I love his ministry and the way God uses him, don't you? Let's give the whole worship band another round of applause. <laughs> When creating this message, um, I had a hard time putting a title to it when I was putting it together. At first I thought, um, let's see, the name of this message will be Twisted. And then the more I worked on it, I thought, no, the name for this message is going to be There's Reason for Concern. But the more I worked on it, I thought, no, I think the message should be You're on a Reckless Path. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to name it The Message with Three Titles. So tonight, you get a message with three titles. We're going to throw that up on the screen. And so I think that means that I get to speak for three hours tonight. Is that right, Dr. Steve? Oh, maybe not. I, I wouldn't put you through that. Anyway, years ago, scientists discovered how to graft certain kinds of species of insects together if they did it very early in stages of their development. And so naturally, this kind of experimentation produced some extremely hideous monstrosities. And one in particular was the grafting of a spider butterfly. Now, this loathsome creature sought to live in the dark and the lightness all at the same time. It would try to fly and crawl in the same movement. And it, it wanted to feast off the fragrance of flowers, but at the same time, it wanted to uh, mess around and eat and feast off of the dead, loathsome bodies of flies. It was just a huge contradiction, a spider butterfly. Well, sometimes... As we look at humanity, as we scan the horizon of, of men and women, once in a while, we'll find a human being that's filled with just such contradictions. Kind of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type of character. And in the book of Numbers, we find just such a person. His name is Balaam. Now, he's been described as an angelic devil. Okay, the very term contradicts itself, doesn't it? Angelic devil. Uh, his, his story is fascinating, and it begins in Numbers chapter 22. So if you have your own Bible, I want you to turn to that. We'll throw it up on the screen in case you don't have your own Bible, and I'll be reading from the Living Bible, so that's the version that will be on the screen. But if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Numbers chapter 22. Now let's jump ahead and let's look at the first few verses in Numbers 22 from the Living Bible. Okay, here we go. The people of Israel, remember we talked about them yesterday morning. They're God's chosen people. He had rescued them from the cruel rule of Pharaoh and he's brought them out of slavery. He's promised them a specific portion of land over here that's deemed the promised land. And so that's who we're talking about when we mention the children of Israel. They now traveled to the plains of Moab and camped east of the Jordan River opposite Jericho. When King Balak of Moab realized how many of them there were, and when he learned what they had done to the Amorites, he and his people were terrified. 
Now, let me jump in here here. What's going on? Well, again, God's chosen people, the people of Israel, are making their way to the promised land. Remember, it's taking over 40 years for them to get there. But as they're making their way, God has empowered them to overcome anyone that stands in their way. He's given them great victories along the way. And so evil King Balak has just heard that they've annihilated the Amorites. Okay, let's continue with Scripture. They quickly consulted with the leaders of Midian. This mob will eat us like an ox eats grass, they exclaimed. So King Balak sent messengers to Balaam who was living in his native land of Pethor near the Euphrates River. He begged Balaam to come and help him. Okay, now again, we have evil King Balak. And he's heard of the Israelites, the children of God, God's chosen people. He knows that God is giving them the ability to annihilate anyone who stands in their path and won't let them cross through to get to the promised land. He's just heard that the Israelites have overthrown the Amorites and they have killed King Og of Bashan. And so, of course, they've left no survivors. And when he sees them, thousands upon thousands, coming toward his turf... He panics. He's frightened, and he should be, because he doesn't have a relationship with Jehovah God. So he was living in fear. When, when we're in constant communication with God, we don't need to live in fear. Let's look at 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The man who fears is not made perfect in love. So if there's a little bit of fear in your life tonight when it comes to your relationship with God, it could be because something in your life isn't right with God. And so if you're afraid of God or if you're fearful, simply ask him, Father, is there something in my life that I'm, that's not right with you? If so, bring that to my mind so we can get that straightened out, so I can confess it and give it to you. Well, because King Balak was not living in God's love, he was trembling in fear. And again, when he sees the thousands upon thousands of Israelites, God's chosen people, coming toward him and his land, he panics and he contacts Balaam. Why? Why Balaam? I mean, who in the world is Balaam? Well, we get the answer in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. Here we go. Balaam was the son of Beor, who loved being paid for doing wrong. Ooh. Balaam loved being paid for doing wrong. Now, here's what's fascinating. Balaam calls himself a prophet of God, but he's deeply steeped in the occult. He's made a reputation for himself as one who has the ability to place curses on people. He's a professional cursor, and he's making a good living by pronouncing evil on others. So King Balak offers Balaam a good sum of money, a whole pile of money. We don't know how much it was. Was it half a million? Was it a million? We don't know, but it was a lot of money to pronounce a curse on God's people, the Israelites. Now remember, Balaam has two sides, right? Angelic devil, godly prophet, professional cursor. <laughs> Let's look at his angelic side for a moment because he did have some noble qualities. First of all, he was a brilliant man with great oratory power. In fact, folks often spoke of him as the silver tongue or the golden mouth. In other words, give him the info, give him the details, and he can spin it. He can make it sound just right. Do you know some politicians like that? <laughs> Do you know some late-night TV preachers like that? I've seen some like that. You've heard some like that, haven't you? Give them the info, and they can sell you anything. Well, Balaam could do that. He was a silver tongue. He was articulate. He was dynamic. He knew how to grab an audience and put them right there in the palm of his hand. Number two, he intellectually knew what was right. Number three, he had some really well-defined convictions. You can read about those on your own in Numbers chapter 22, 15 to 18. Number four, he possessed an amazing knowledge of God. He prayed to God, and he sought God's will. And number five, he seemed eager 
for divine guidance. So if we just look at this stack of his noble qualities, it seems like Balaam has his act together spiritually, doesn't it? It sounds like, and it looks like, yeah, theologically, this guy is solid. I think we can trust him. But remember, he has a dual personality. Remember, he's a living contradiction, an angelic devil, a godly prophet steeped in the occult and making a good living of pronouncing evil curses from people. <laughs> So what does Balaam do when evil King Balak comes to him and offers him a pile of money to come and place a curse on God's people? What does Balaam do? Well, <laughs> he prays about it. Now, can you imagine even entertaining the thought of praying about such a thing? There are some things you just don't have to pray about. <laughs> this would be one of them, I would think. Can you imagine Pastor Terry? going to the Lord and saying, Father, would you allow me to curse some of the people in my church because they've just missed a few Sundays that I don't, I don't like them being gone. No, he would never do that. He's crazy about you. He loves you to pieces. He wouldn't even entertain the thought. What Christian would entertain the thought? But again, he's an angelic devil. He's a living contradiction. So Balaam prays. He actually prays and asks God, can I curse? Can I place an evil curse on your people? And of course, you know what God says. God says, no. Of course you cannot place a curse on my people. So evil king Balak comes back and he sweetens the pot. And he offers Balaam a lot more money. Now, this is more money than Balaam has ever heard of. More money than he's ever seen. More money than he's ever imagined. He will be set for life if he can just take this pot at the end of the rainbow. And, and so Balaam actually goes back to God and prays about it again. Are you kidding me? Balaam, do you not know God very well? You call yourself a godly prophet. And he actually uttered some of the most wonderful and beautiful prophecies about God's judgment ever given in the entire Old Testament. What's going on here? Something's twisted. There's reason for concern here. Balaam is on a dangerous path. Now you understand why I kind of had to deal with all those three titles, don't you? How can you just deal with one when you're dealing with somebody like Balaam? Okay, so he goes to God again. He prays about the matter again. But get this, this time when he prays, he's not asking God to do what's right. He's asking God for permission to do what he knew was wrong. Uh-oh. Balaam is no longer asking God what's right. He's asking God for permission to do what he already knows is wrong. Can you imagine, please, God, I know it's wrong, and I know it would be a sin, but would you allow me to curse the Christians? What? What? When you find yourself asking God permission to do something that you know is wrong, something's twisted. When you find yourself asking God permission to do what you know is wrong, there is reason for concern. When you find yourself asking God permission to do what you know is wrong, you're on a reckless path. You see, Balaam wants to stay on good terms with evil Balak and also wants to stay on good terms with God. He wants to have a foot in the world and a foot in the church. It doesn't work that way, does it? You know what Christ said to the church at Laodicea in Revelation? He said, you are lukewarm. You're neither hot, you're neither cold. You've got a foot in the world and a foot in the church. So I, I want to vomit you from my mouth. We can't afford to be lukewarm. We can't afford casual Christianity. We must stand on one side of the fence. We're going to be sold out and serve God in radical obedience to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. or we're going to be on a reckless path. There will be reason for concern. So again, Balaam is asking God to do. He's asking God permission to do what he knows is wrong. And, and how does he go about doing this? He prays. 
he prays. In Numbers 22, verses 8 through 12, we see that Balaam keeps praying and keeps praying and praying and praying and praying until he convinces himself <coughs> that what he once knew was wrong is now not only okay, but it's actually right. Ooh, that's dangerous territory. He's rationalizing. I wish I could push the pause button here and just leap inside the story and travel back a few centuries. I want to say, Balaam, something's twisted. You're calling yourself a godly prophet, and now you're, you're con you've convinced yourself through prayer that what you know is wrong is now the right thing to do? Balaam, you're on a reckless path. Oh, Balaam, there is big reason to be concerned here. And again, on his knees is where he succeeds in blinding himself, trying to convince himself it's okay, it's the right thing to curse God's people. Whoa. You see, he becomes disloyal to his own conscience, and a civil war begins on the inside. When you play loose with your conscience, you kill its confirmation. When you seek to do right, you see clearly. But when you know what's right and you try to justify doing wrong, you kill your ability to hear God clearly. Again, I want to repeat, where and how did he convince himself that what was wrong is now right on his knees. It would have been a lot easier for me to swallow this if I would have read, and so he convinced himself that what was wrong is now right as he was drinking in a bar. Okay, yeah, that would cloud his vision. That would mess him up. Now I understand. Uh, or maybe he, he convinced himself that what was wrong is now not only okay, but it's the right thing to do, as he was so stoned on drugs, he couldn't think straight. He was so addicted to pornography and so deeply steeped in sexual sin. He finally convinced himself this is the right thing to do. No, it was on his knees. It was in prayer, this godly prophet convinces himself what was wrong is now not just okay. It is the right thing to do. God, help us. <laughs> we have some people in the church who are walking on some dangerous territory. It's a reckless path. There's reason to be concerned. Something's twisted. <laughs> I'm sure that Pastor Terry, over the course of years of his ministry and pastoring churches, I'm sure that he has probably counseled people who have come to him and said, Pastor Terry, I know that really, generally speaking, having an affair is wrong. I, I know that, generally speaking. But you see, my, sp my husband, he travels all the time. He's never here. My needs are not being met. Or, Pastor Terry, my wife is disabled. She's in a wheelchair, and I have these natural God-given needs. And I know in most situations to have an affair would be wrong but I've prayed through on it and I have God's peace that it's okay in my situation I'll bet you there are tons of pastors who have heard that kind of rationalization rationalization I'll, I'll guarantee Pastor Terry has heard in counseling over the years oh I know that scripture that says don't be unequally yoked <laughs> most of the time you shouldn't marry an unbeliever but you know what? I prayed about it, and oh, I love him so much. He's just such a great guy. Or she's a wonderful lady. She doesn't know the Lord, but, you know, we can work on that later. In my situation, I have a deep peace about it. I think it's okay for me. God help us. God does not contradict himself, and his word doesn't contradict himself. And we, when we convince ourselves that he does, something's twisted. We're on a dangerous path. There's reason for concern. So Balaam was this strange mixture of evil and good, of light and darkness. In one place, he looks like a true prophet of God. Again, espousing some of the most beautiful prophecies in the Old Testament regarding God's judgment. And then in other situations, he stoops so low that we can't help but think, what? How could you, Balaam? What's going on? 
So Balaam prayed. He sought God's will. He's convinced himself that God has given him permission to go to the Israelites who are now marching toward King Balak's countryside at a rapid pace. And here's where the story takes a very fascinating and interesting turn. On the way to curse God's people, Balaam's donkey starts talking. Seriously? Susie, do you really believe that? <laughs> well, if you can believe the first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created, then you can believe the rest of it. It's simply a choice. And I choose to believe the word of God. I believe that the same God who made a rooster crow, the same God who made a cow moo or a dog bark, the same God who put a little voice box that can make sounds in a donkey, if he wanted to, could cause a donkey to say actual words. This is the only situation I've ever heard of that it's been done, but I believe that the Bible is true. And so I believe in this situation, God did. He caused the donkey to talk. But I think it's kind of funny because uh, he, Balaam wants to curse the people of God. Why? So he can get a lot of money. I, I, again, I'd love to pause it and just leap inside the story and say, Balaam, do you really need to curse God's people? Look at what you have here. You have a donkey who talks. Take that act on the road. <laughs> I mean, there's no telling how much money you can get for a talking donkey. You don't need to curse God's people. Wow. But due to, to Balaam's secret desire... To disobey God for money, God sends an angel to stop him. Actually, in verse 23, it says that the angel was sent to kill him, but God is merciful, and he, saw, he decides to just warn him. He wants to give Balaam one more chance. So let's pick up the story now in Numbers chapter 22, verses 23 to 27. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat her to get her back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she just lay down under Balaam. And he was angry and beat her with his staff. Okay, so three times, three times this donkey puzzles Balaam. He can't figure out why she's acting this way because he doesn't see what she sees. First, she runs off the road. He beats her to get her back on the road. Okay, when your animal is, is more tuned in to God than you are, something's twisted. Second, she scrapes his foot to stay out of the angel's way. He beats her again. Okay, when your animal is making wiser choices than you're making, you're on a reckless path. And finally, she just lays flat down in the road, furious. Balaam beats her again, and then it happens. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she began to talk. Okay, when your animal speaks in complete sentences, using a subject and a noun and a verb, there's reason for concern. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, Well, you've made a fool out of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you right now. It's amazing, isn't it? The donkey reasons with this man about why she's being whipped, and Balaam answers her. I mean, he doesn't even miss a beat. Donkey talks, he answers back. Why wasn't he going, Whoa, wait a minute. Did you just use a subject, a noun, and a verb? Did you just create a complete sentence? Oh my goodness, did I forget to take my vitamins this morning? What's happening to me? <laughs> okay, when your back's against a wall, or when your foot is twisted against a rock, your true character comes out. 
and we see what Balaam was focused on. We see his character coming out, and we see what he's focused on. He's way more concerned with what people are thinking about him than he was about obeying God. Again, he said, you've made a fool out of me in front of these dignitaries. <laughs> okay, well, you are having a conversation with a donkey, and guess who's winning, Balaam? <laughs> the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey? which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. The donkey is making more sense than Balaam. When your animal is more logical than you are, something's twisted. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. And so he bowed down low and fell face down. Finally, God has Balaam where he wants him, flat on his face before the Father, humbled in desperation, in great need of him. That's exactly where God wants us. Flat on our face before him. God, I need you as we sang. Lord, I need you. Flat on our face. Oh, God, I need you. Humbled and desperate before him. So what happens here? Balaam's flat on his face. He's humbled before God. What happens? He seeks God's forgiveness. God tells him to get up and go to the Israelites, but only tell them what he says to tell them. Okay, I want to just stop here for a moment. Balaam heads for the Israelites, yes. Balaam has stopped, and he's asked God to forgive him. But yet, it's not, oh, dear God, will you forgive me? I'm so sorry, I have sinned. I have broken your heart. I've disobeyed. No, it's not like that. When Balaam asks God to forgive him, he's asking God like this. Sorry about that. Susie, how do you know? That doesn't, doesn't say that in Scripture. Well, I, I'll tell you, because of how the story progresses, we know that that's how he asked God to forgive him. Sorry about that. Balaam wasn't truly repenting. You see, in the Greek language, the language in which the New Testament was originally written, the word repent means to turn completely away from and walk the opposite direction. Balaam doesn't do that. Here he is in his little sinful lifestyle. Sure, he calls himself a prophet of God, but he's engaged in some satanic, obviously evil and sinful activity. And he has this secret desire to get around God. I will disobey. I will get the money. He's hatching a plan in his heart, and his mind. How do you know, Susie? Because as we read on, the plan will unfold. And so here he is in his little sinful lifestyle spot. Forgive me? Sorry about that. He doesn't actually repent and walk away. He doesn't turn away and walk away from a sinful lifestyle. He stays in a sinful lifestyle, and he feeds that secret desire to disobey God. I will get around it. I will get the money. I will disobey. I think I can make this work. I can figure out. I can figure it out how I can stay on good terms with God and how I can still get the pile of money, how I can uh, you know, act like I'm obeying God, but how I can really place a curse, an evil curse on God's people. I know I can do it. I know I can figure this out. I've got it covered. I just know I can. I've got a strategy. I've got a plan. So what did he do? He started building altars. On the outside, that looked like a pretty good thing to do. God loved altars. But what does God love more, altars or obedience? Obedience. What's most important to God? Obedience. That's always the right answer. <laughs> obedience will always be the right answer. So he's building all these altars thinking, okay, good. I'm doing all the right things on the outside. I'm showing God that on the outside, I'm headed in the right direction. Maybe God doesn't know about my secret desire the hatch, the plan that I'm hatching, the plan that I'm formulating here, because I will get the money. I will get around this. And you'll see as the story unfolds how he tries to get around it. So he builds all these altars. God does not care about our altars. He's concerned with our obedience. He could care less. He could care less about the programs. He cares less about our programs and more about our obedience. So he's asked God for forgiveness, sure, sorry about that, forgive me, but he has not repented. He's not actually turned away from his sin. He's not walking the opposite direction. Many of us are in this same little spot. We say, well, sure, God has forgiven my sin. Well, yeah, I asked God to forgive me. Yeah, I'm here at Revival, aren't I, on a Monday night? I sure had a lot of other things to do, but I came here. But we're still living within our little lifestyle of sin. We still 
We still haven't given up all of a sinful lifestyle. We've never actually repented totally and walked completely away from a sinful lifestyle. We're still hanging on to that one thing. Still hanging on to that one sin. Still hanging on to a piece of our evil or our former or our old or our carnal or natural lifestyle. God wants us to walk completely away. Balaam was playing with God, and many of us are there. When your animal has a more genuine relationship with its creator than you do, you're on a reckless path. Now, in Numbers chapter 23, we see Balaam building the altars. He's trying to change God's mind. And again, it's always about obedience with God. There's nothing more important than obeying God. So Balaam and Balak, evil king Balak, go to a high place where they can see down below the thousands upon thousands of Israelites, God's chosen people, coming toward their territory. Here they come. Here they come. They see them coming. And Balaam has already chosen the dishwater, dirty words that he's going to open his mouth and curse on them. I mean, he has chosen, he has selected sewage filth to espouse to God's people. Vile, unthinkable words. He's already put them together in his heart, the phrases. And he opens his mouth to bring them up from his heart, through his vocal cords and out of his mouth. And when he does, God intervenes. The hand of God intervenes and rearranges the letters in the words, rearranges the syllables, transforms the words, and what comes out of Balaam's mouth are actual blessings on God's people. Well, you can imagine how furious Balaam is and also how confused he is. Whoa, what's going on? I mean, my donkey's been talking to me. And he's making sense. And the words that I've chosen, I don't know what happened to them. I mean, I selected these words. I put them together in tight, vile sentences. And so he tries again. Dishwater, dirty, unthinkable, vile words. But he vomits out wonderful blessings on God's people instead. He's angry. He can't figure it out. He tries again. And again, the very same thing happens. Guess what? God always has the last word. We can make our own plans. We think, oh, I can get around God. I think I can make it work out. I've got a strategy. I'm hatching a plan. God always will have the last word. He always will. We can't get around him. Disobeying God is extremely dangerous. When you disobey, something's twisted. There's reason for concern. When you disobey, you're on a reckless path. And by now, Balaam is entering territory that's so forbidden, there will be no turning back. He's now entering into the hardened heart territory. Again, something's twisted. There's great reason for concern. He's on a reckless path. Balaam, again, tries to get around God by introducing the, the men of Israel to the Moabite women. You see, Balaam couldn't curse God's people with his mouth, but he could curse them with seduction. Balaam says, I can't curse Israel, but I'll tell you how to get them to bring a curse upon themselves. Get the women of Moab. Get them to offer themselves to the men of Israel, and when they yield, a plague will come upon them. And guess what? In Numbers 25, 9, we're told that 24,000 died in that plague. Oh, what a disgraceful, atrocious, hideous thing for Balaam to do. He's causing God's people to sin. Well, Susie, they disobeyed him in the past. I mean, we know all the stories about... The children of Israel, they remember when they built the idol and Moses came down and he smashed the Ten Commandments because they built a golden calf. and They disobeyed God before. But you know, they're really trying. And now they're at a point where they're really trying to do what's right. They're really striving to live in the center of God's will, to obey him as they march into the promised land. They're really trying. And now this godly prophet <laughs> causes them to sin by bringing out the women and say, go ahead, seduce them. They'll fall for it. They'll bring a plague upon themselves. Oh, my goodness. You know what Jesus said in Matthew? 
about those of us who cause others to sin. He said, better it would be for a millstone to be tied around us and for us to be cast into the sea. We are not to cause other people to sin. But here's the wild thing. He's not causing sinners to continue sinning. He's causing God's chosen people to sin. And he calls himself a godly prophet. Wow. Something is really twisted. Man. In Numbers 31.8, we're told that Balaam is killed. Well, how did he die? He died from fighting against the children of God, the Israelites. <laughs> he actually killed God's people and died in that fight. We can't have the favor of God and the pleasure of sin. Now, as we wrap this up, three quick things that we learn from Balaam. Here are three truths that I want you to swallow as we just wrap this up. Number one, you can have godly characteristics, angelic characteristics. You can have great communication with God, but yet not fully trust Him as your Savior. Balaam had great communication with God. He prayed. He sought God's will. He knew a lot about God. But he must have never trusted God genuinely as his Savior, or I don't think we would find him in this twisted situation. And it could be that you have done wonderful things. Maybe you teach a Sunday school class. You're here at Revival. That's wonderful. You own a Bible or three or five, and you read it, and you're here at church, and you would say, yeah, I think God's forgiven me. Yeah, God's forgiven my sins. But maybe your relationship with him really isn't the real deal. You know a lot about him. But if you died tonight, do you know for sure that you would enter the kingdom of heaven? Number two, you may know God's will, but not be living in it. Here I am in my little lifestyle, my little pile of sin. Sorry about that. Will you forgive me? <laughs> but never really walking away. I know it's God's will for me to walk completely away from this lifestyle of sin. But I'm still holding on to a little bit of sin in my life. I'm just not sure I can let it go. I know God's will, but I'm not living in it. And lastly, number three, you may be on a reckless path. Parts of your life look great. Again, you're involved in church. You're reading the Bible. But could there be just an area of your life and maybe you haven't even realized it until now, that's just become a, a little twisted. You just got comfortable with something in your life that God never intended for you to get comfortable with. Could it be there's something in your life with which you've learned to coexist? And it's taking up more and more of your life than you ever expected that it would. Then you're on a dangerous path. And there is reason to be concerned. You're on a reckless path. That's how Numbers 22, 32 describes Balaam's journey. But I want us to look at this same scripture as we close in a variety of different Bible versions. You're on a reckless path is from the New International Version. But from the New Century Version, that same scripture is, your way is contrary to me. The Living Bible says, you are headed for destruction. The King James Version says, thy way is perverse before me. And the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, what you are doing is evil in my sight. The Good News Bible, oh, you should not be making this journey. God's Word translation, the trip you're taking is evil. The New English Translation, what you are doing is perverse before me. And again, in the NIV, you're on a reckless path, or your path is a reckless one before me. In other words, something got twisted. Never meant for it to, but something in my life just got a little twisted. In other words, I should really be concerned. There's reason for concern tonight. I could be on a reckless path. So what will you do about it? In the few moments that we have remaining tonight, would you allow God to turn you around and set you on the path of righteousness? To turn you around and set you on the right path? 
Right now, I would love for you to pray silently this prayer. Dear Jesus, will you pray this silently? Dear Jesus, am I on a reckless path? Dear Jesus, is there anything in my life that's become twisted? Jesus, am I on a reckless path? Father, have I begun to coexist with something in my life that you never meant to happen? If so, Jesus, tonight I need you. And I need you to turn me around. And I need you to point me in the right path, in the right direction. Now, in a few moments, Kyle is going to lead us in, Lord, I need you. But before he does, there's a contemporary Christian artist named Aaron O'Donnell years ago who wrote a little song called Twisted. And it encapsulates exactly what I'm saying tonight. So we're going to put the words on the screen. And as you read through the words as she's singing them, again, I want you to be praying, Lord, have I gotten a little twisted? Is there something in my life that I've learned to coexist with that shouldn't be there? If so, bring that to my mind. And then after that, Kyle will come up and he will lead us. We'll stand and he will lead us. Lord, I need you. That's the answer. And that's your chance to respond in obedience by coming forward and allowing God to turn you around. So let's listen to the words, read the words, listen to the song, Twisted, by Aaron O'Donnell.
let's stand as Kyle leads us in, Lord, I need you. And if you'd like to come pray, if there's something in your life that isn't as it should be with God, would you go ahead and move forward right now as Kyle leads us in this song? Pray together, Father, here we are. I believe that you really desired and intended for us, your church tonight, to hear the story. Lord, your grace is so powerful. You desire to reach every one of us and extend to us mercy, forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you will help me I guess I just feel that I need to confess for us the church I feel that for so long Lord that we have not been grace giving people Oh, yes, Lord, it's, it's 
kind of easy for us to praise you and thank you for people when they come and pray at the altars. And we're grateful for that. Lord, I pray for these tonight that are praying and maybe somebody that's just stayed in their pew that's just praying. And Lord, we want to encourage them. But Lord, we, we are people that uh, we speak an awful lot about love. How we're to love others. We preach some pretty significant messages about love your enemies. But when we're out on the street, when we're at the coffee shop or speaking to our Christian neighbors, I'm not sure we've done a very good job of loving those who aren't like us. Oh, it's not blatant. We're not out uh, killing anybody. But Lord, sometimes we speak words. Words that don't match. So, Lord, I just pray that we, your church, would not be carrying the name of Balaam. But that we would carry the name of Christ. So, Lord, we prepare to go from this place this evening. I'm thankful that you've given us more grace. You have said to us again tonight, you love us, that you have a plan for us. In fact, Lord, we're reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul that says, you desire to do immeasurably more than we could ever think or ask. So, Lord, may I take a hold. May I walk the righteous path. May I truly love as you have loved me. So, Lord, here we go into your world, determined, declaring that we need you. Lord, help us to clear the stage and get our minds fixed and focused on who you are so that we can truly be consumed by your love and love others. Thanks. Thanks for Susie tonight. Thank you for her heart and her desire to proclaim your word. Thank you for the ears of these people tonight that have listened. And, oh, Lord, may we be obedient. Amen. Amen. Go now in the grace of our Lord and Savior. You are dismissed. Thank you for watching today online. It has been our privilege to share this time with you. I'm Pastor Terry Armstrong, and I want you to know that if we can do anything to assist you, any words that you would like to say, any comments that you would like to make, or anything that you would like to tell us about what God is doing in your life, please do not hesitate to give us a call. Our number is 405-376-2892. Or you can email me directly at terry at mustangnaz.org. Again, we just hope that today your spirit your heart has been encouraged by the presence of God. And so now I just want to say to you, may the peace of our Lord and Savior reign and rule, and may He give you His calmness in the midst of your storms. 
In Christ's name we pray these things for you. Amen and amen.